been going to Bulgaria and following the Bulgarian wine industry for probably more years than I should admit to. But um, I first went to Bulgaria back in about 1989 as a, um, I think I was a diploma student then. I don't think I'd even started on the Master of Wine. But, um, you know, and at the time it was kind of, um, I was actually working as a junior buyer then and I got Eastern Europe because it was the least glamorous part of the portfolio. <laughs> Um, and I remember going and staying in a hotel that was the former party headquarters. And if you're on one side of the corridor, you could have um, warm water, but it was brown. And if on the other side of the corridor, you could have clear water, but you couldn't have it hot. So it was kind of that level of, of organisation back then. Um, and still very much um, the old communist system where the industry was all about volumes of wine flavored alcoholic beverage particularly for supply into the soviet Union, as it would have been back then so with hindsight i was incredibly lucky to be sort of there at the beginning of the new era and sort of be able to follow bulgaria's progress over the last um 25 years um which is kind of an i feel it's very closely connected to my own career going from a junior buyer just starting in the wine trade all the way through to passing my master of wine and over recent years particularly specializing in central and eastern europe um, so over the i mean i could talk at great length uh, on the politics and so on of, of what happened in Bulgaria post privatization but I think I don't want to dwell too much on the past I want to dwell particularly on the sort of current scenario and and where Bulgaria I think Bulgaria is going and highlight some of the developments I've seen through kind of the, the range of wines that we're going to have have in front of us um, so, of course, post-privatisation, the first kind of privatisation steps were about privatising the old state wineries. And at that point, the wines and the land were very much separated. The link between the vineyards and, and winemaking had very much been broken. And I remember going on a trip in about 2003, and clearly winemakers at that point thought that grapes grew in the back of trucks. You know. <laughs> And the, the grape growing was a completely separate industry. But what has happened since then, um, and it was kind of starting at around that point, is there's been a huge, huge investment in vineyards and in wineries owning vineyards. So that started off with being the large scale wineries, particularly, I think, because to some extent, because of EU funding and the way that worked was that to get uh, pre-accession funding, you actually had to be financially viable to get a loan from the EU or get a subsidy from the EU. You actually already had to be quite wealthy. So to start off with, the sort of privatisation and the, the development of vineyards and so on did tend to be bigger operations. Also at that point, there wasn't terribly much of a wine culture in Bulgaria itself. It's still a country that is kind of a wine producing country with a bit of an inclination towards having a spirits culture. Um, every meal starts with a glass of rakia, which is their local equivalent of grappa. Um, but what I have seen, particularly accelerating over the last few years, is that there is much more of an interest in Bulgaria in wines. There's much better food, better restaurants, and I think that local wine culture has helped to support um, some of these smaller producers that we're having a look at today. And again, that's been a really exciting development for me because Bulgaria used to be about big industrial producers who were then privatized and started to make, you know, have own vineyards, but on a big scale, um, this development of small independent wine growers who have come into wine really because they're really passionate about wine rather than seeing it as an industrial product um, with their own vineyards or their own you know ways of sourcing their grapes um, which i'll talk about you know when we get on to some of the wines um, this is really exciting for me because it's these smaller people who are the ones that I think can push the boundaries and connect. They've got the freedom to experiment uh, because they own the, 
wines themselves. They haven't got to answer to shareholders or shadowy owners who, when you ask them what they do, they say business, and you think, okay, I'm going to back off here. You know. Um, so somebody said to me on Moldova a couple of weeks ago, wine shouldn't be political, but um, actually it does end up being political because if it's a significant economic industry to a country. But let's concentrate on the wines rather than the politics. So um, the first wine that we have in front of us is um, Tamjanica is the grape which um, you may or may not know, uh, Julia probably knows, but maybe not anybody else, that this is actually a, 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 a muscat. And it's a muscat blanc, or a muscat a petit grain. So it's the high quality muscat. And it always endlessly frustrates me that in Eastern Europe, people grow muscat autonelle. And I don't know why, because Tamjanica, in all its various guises, um, I think is a much, much more interesting form of muscat. You, know, it's, it's, uh, you get much finer, much more expressive wines from it, I think. So, um, so um, this is... Um, and I think this is a, a winery that kind of... The story of the winery is, is perhaps worth telling you to highlight kind of some of the changes that have happened in Bulgaria. So grandfather of this this family had 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 owned the biggest vineyard in the village you know pre um, the communist era and he had a whole hectare you know. but um, you know so going back into history Bulgaria has always had um, a strong connection with grape growing and with wine production um, most of the ancient land of Thrace um, where Dionysius, the god of wine, was believed, it was claimed to have been born. Um, most of the ancient land of Thrace is actually in modern-day Bulgaria, and they keep regularly finding sort of um, tombs and temples and things dedicated to the worship of Dionysius. Um, and I went to see the Panagurishte treasures a couple of weeks ago, which are these fantastic pieces of gold formed into ceremonial drinking cups. And, you know, if you have a chance to go and see this, it's amazing. You know, and these date back to about, they think, the 3rd or 4th century BC. So there's been a very, very long historical connection with wine in Bulgaria that, say, was rather broken in the sort of communist era. So kind of going back to people's roots. So the family inherited um, this hectare of vineyards and decided that, uh, so the father of the current owners decided that he would like to actually build up a plot of, of, of a decent sized plot of vineyards. And it actually took him five years to, to persuade neighbors to sell and to put together a plot of vineyards. And they've ended up with about 24 hectares. One of the problems post-privatisation was land ended up being very, very fragmented, so very small holdings of land, and actually getting people together and dealing with, you know, being able to pay the lawyers to deal with the land contracts for sometimes dozens, and in some bigger cases, hundreds of small owners of vineyards to actually put together a plot has actually been quite a major undertaking. So, you know, five years to put together 24 hectares, quite an undertaking. A challenge. Um, they're down in South Sakar, um, right down towards the uh, the south east of the country, down towards the Greek border. So it would be um, Thracian lowlands would be the PGI here. Um, and this particular vintage was the first time they did Tamianica solo, um, basically tank fermented with just 10% going into a barrel. So I'm going to hand over to um, either Stephen or Richard to actually do some commenting on the wine. Richard, I see, has tasted the whole lot with Ivo, so he knows all about them. Um, I've only been to Sapphire once in my life and um, for a wine fair. Um, I'm just going to sort of talk about how I think these wines fit into to, you know, what's required by modern wine drinkers, of whom you're a fine example. I think this is delicious. It's slightly floral, very pale in colour, dry finish, lovely aperitif. Um, they are making more and more dry muscas in the south of France, in the, yeah, in the Midi, but they can't really get it that floral. They either strip it. Allow them, if they want to make it dry, they kind of strip the muscat aromas out of it. 
or if they leave the muscatiness in, it, it's uh, much, it's, it's not as dry as that. I find that a really delicious aperitif. Maybe it'll replace the grappa they have as an aperitif. Uh, and it's a delightful wine. For me, it wouldn't quite, wouldn't quite replace um, Hidalgo's La Gitana, but it would come pretty close. Stephen, you obviously realise that actually most of the Muscat Blanc in uh, Bulgaria does go to make grappa. That's, a, that's the grape they use. Um, this, uh, I had the advantage of tasting these wines with Ivo three or four weeks ago, and uh, so had a part to play in the selection of the wines for this tasting. And the aim was really to show that the breadth of what Bulgaria has got, and different regions, different producers, and different grape varieties as well. And this one... I thought stood out. As Caroline said, Tamianka is, is an exciting grape. I find this very muscatty, very lifted, and a lovely freshness to it. Beautiful balance. Dry muscat is not easy to make. Um, it, you know, it, 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 we see a bit in Alsace, an increasing amount in southern France, but a lot of the southern French examples are quite dilute, and they haven't got the aromatics that the sweeter muscats have. I find this a beautifully balanced example. Um, just really well done. Considering it comes from the southern part of the country, they've done a wonderful job of retaining the freshness in this. We're then going to move on to a lineup of um, three very, very different Chardonnays. Um, so maybe you'd like to sort of taste them in comparison, and I can tell you a little bit about each of the producers. Um, uh, so the first one we have in front of us, Residi. Um, Eddie, who's here, and his Austrian-trained winemaker have a very a small garage winery near Sliven. And um, he was telling me that actually the, the old guys in the region think he's mad to plant Chardonnay here because um, they're saying, oh, it doesn't produce the yields. But actually, you know, that's... In terms of quality, that's a good thing. So it is naturally producing about 45 hectolitres a hectare, which is quite a low yield for, for Bulgaria, certainly in terms of the commercial wine production, but sort of naturally very high quality fruit. Um, very thoughtful winemaking in terms of experimenting with, you know, not just following the standard recipe of... of oak barrels and malolactic fermentation on this first Chardonnay. Actually, there's no malolactic at all. There is no oak, um, and it's been fermented in one of these very trendy concrete eggs, um, which gives a kind of um, very subtle micro-oxidation in a way that barrels do, but without the actual effect of oak. Um, and I'm actually a big believer in Chardonnay in Bulgaria. I know it's not the world's trendiest grape variety at the moment. Um, and I know Bulgaria is particularly associated with red wines. And in fact, about 62% of the plantings in Bulgaria are now red wines and 38% therefore um, white wines particularly. But so, and, and red wines are what everybody thinks of when they think Bulgaria. But so, particularly Chardonnay, I think it does does well in Bulgaria in the right places. There's really some really good quality fruit and interesting potential in the wines. Um, and then sort of going on next to it, we've got Evo's uh, 2013 Chardonnay um, from again, down near Lubiomet, so South Sakar. Uh, both of these would be um, Thracian lowlands as well. Um, but much more classic fermentation with, with oak fermentation and ageing here. But again, I think you see in, for me, both these wines, there's a, there's a lovely quality to the fruit. Um, and then moving on to the Borovitsa, we're actually here up in the Danube Plain, um, in the far, far northwest of the country, which is a very interesting and quite unique terroir because um, it's much cooler than the rest of the country, but very, very long sunshine hours um, and some benefits from, because it's very close to the Danube, you get the benefits from the Danube reflecting sunlight back into the vineyards, sloping sites and so on. Um, and I should explain a little bit about the colour here. Um, 
the winemaker said to me, he said, this particular, the first year they made this wine, he had two batches of Chardonnay come in. And he's a guy that does um, a lot of work with actually buying uh, grapes from local growers where he finds a plot, or he and his partner, Adriana, find a plot owned by somebody who's got some old vines and some interesting fruit. So he does quite a lot of work like that. So two lots of Chardonnay come in that year, and he said one we called Fanta Lemon and one we called Fanta Orange, because that was the colour of the skins when the fruit came in. It was the natural colour of the skins. It's not forced orange wine, like, you know, has become rather trendy in this natural wine movement. And he said it was all a bit of a disaster, the orange wine. They fermented it and, and vinified it as it came in, and it kept its orange colour, and they sold the Fanta Lemon like that. The Fanta Orange sat in the winery and they left it. And they said, well, we're the owners, you know, we can have the freedom to sit on it. We don't have to sell it. Um, and they said they had a particular couple of families come to the w uh, winery one weekend, taste the wine. The guys didn't like it. The women did and bought, the, bought it. And then the next weekend, the same thing happened. They sold it all out in 20 days. Um, so they've continued to make this orange garden chardonnay with that same lot of grapes it only has a couple of hours maceration in the press so it's not a long maceration like so many of the orange and amber wines you get around the world no sulfites and then just very natural fermentation in a big 3000 liter neutral oak barrel so and that's really uh, with this particular winemaker, again, it's very much a reflection of what has come in from the vineyard and trying not to interfere with it. Um, and that's the result. What a fascinating contrast in styles, those three. I, I mean, we, we know that Chardonnay is... If you, if you make it without oak, Chardonnay can often be very neutral and very dull. Uh, the, the first of these, the Rossidi wine, is unoaked, but for me, that's got lots of character. It's got lots of flavour. And I suppose what I like about it is there's a, and maybe this is a slightly pretentious distinction, but I find there's a, a sucrosity on the palate, but not sweetness. So there's a, there's a richness of fruit, but it still finishes dry. And that's what gives it character and flavour. But it tastes quite sweet. That's, uh, but it finishes... Oh, Edward's gone, just when we need him. Five grams, five grams residual sugar. Okay, which is, yeah, so yes, that's a little bit more than one would expect. Um, it's, I always find it difficult, I'm glad you asked, Julia, because I think it's difficult with wines like this. This comes from a, a, warmer, um, a warmer part, again, of Bulgaria, and so, and very often, the slightly higher alcohol that you associate with that can be confused with residual sugar. So, but obviously there is some in that as well. But it finishes very clean and dry. And so there you've got a Chardonnay, an unoaked Chardonnay, with quite a lot of, with quite a lot of character. I find there's a, a slight saltiness on the finish. And it is one of the characteristics of these wines that Evo explained to me when we were tasting, was that even in the south of the country, where you've got wines which are low in acidity, because the wines are very high in dry extract, on the palate, that can still help balance the wines. It's actually dry extract rather than acidity that is providing some of the balance. Um, the second of these, the, uh, the, the, the Vabanov wine, again, f to my mind, nicely judged oak, lots of flavour. It's larger barrels, so containing the oak influence. And again, a wine that's uh, from, from warmer areas, but I don't know, it carries it really nicely. There's a, there's a, there's a lovely depth of flavour there. I, th I find that very, very classy Chardonnay, I must say. And then the, the Orange Garden wine to finish up with, just, um, just fascinating. And I, I love trying a wine like this, which isn't, to my mind, it's not, there's no oxidation there. You've got this incredible, fresh, primary, orange, dare I say it, fruit, a pithy orange flavour, and a bit of tannin on the finish, which is what we come to expect with orange wines. But this is a tannin that, really balances. And this, I'd, I'd, I mean, if, if, I was a, if I was a chef, I'd, I'd have a field day trying to match dishes to this, because I think there's so much character, so much flavour. Really interesting. Danny. I just want to ask you, so is Chardonnay the most important wine uh, variety for Bulgaria? Because I think it's probably 
in terms of export potential, yes. I think that, if I remember correctly, um, things like Dimiat and Miscet Chervin are more planted, but they're not great varieties that really have huge amount of character or potential for producing high quality wines. Um, there's certainly some Sauvignon Blanc around, but generally I think the climate in Bulgaria is too hot to make fine Sauvignon Blanc. Um, what I do think Bulgaria misses, um, you know, Tamianica we've looked at, but there isn't really anything else in high quality, in terms of a high quality native grape white variety. So um, I think Chardonnay probably is the, for me, I think it is the strongest offer that's reasonably widely planted. Pale, very pale, floral, white fruits, clean and fresh. Um, I thought it could be a bit broader. In fact, if you taste, I just tasted the 2013 at the table there, which is uh, much richer, richer extract. And I, 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 Eddie said, I asked him how much time it spent in oak, and he said, none at all, but it does spend six months, or it did spend, that one spent six months in the egg, concrete egg, on its leaves without racking. So that gives the wine a certain amount of flesh. And I think the no mallow is excellent because then you get the you get the clarity. Um, coming afterwards, I thought that Ivo's 2013 was almost sweet. I don't mean sweet certainly, but it seemed to have a richness of fruit, um, which coming after the Rossidi, uh, but beautiful quality, and um, that's obviously an important wine. And um, although it's lovely to drink now, I would certainly leave that a year well, um, six months at least, to allow it to calm down, to allow it to really get the quality back. At the moment, it's just a beautiful Chardonnay, beautifully made, but there's lots of complexity to come. Um, the orange wine, I'm against orange wines in principle because uh, A, I don't understand them, and B, most of them are so cloudy, I don't want to drink them. But I thought this was absolutely fascinating and, and not very Chardonnay, but very good dry flavour, and wonderful vigour, light vigour. I, I think that's fascinating. And, and, and um, if they can make a wine, if <coughs> Borovica can make a wine of that clarity with no sulphites, and they probably don't filter it either, I think it's, it's, it's marvellous, as Richard said, that's for the chefs. But also, any time in the meal, it, it could come really uh, as an aperitif during, after, on its own, five o'clock. I mean, it really is a fascinating wine. To me, the most mainstream of those wines is the is the Varbonoff wine, because we associate top class Chardonnay with the, with the use of oak, and if it's a, a city boy Burgundy drinker, and I love the phrase, um, then that that is the one that is is going to be most familiar to that. And I know when I first tasted this wine, I I, I did think of Burgundy, um, because I think stylistically it's similar. So I think that would be the, the that would be the one that's most familiar. But then, I mean, one would love to be able to encourage people to explore a little bit with the other styles here as well. There's obviously not yet a Bulgarian style. I think this is what the country is, is looking for, to have an image or a profile. Um, it, 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 that would take a long time to come. But um, these wines, are, I, I always try, Richard compared Ivo's to Burgundy, I always try, I mean, mentally or it just appears, actually it's a think what it would be were it in France. And so far, I, I haven't come up with anything. These are very non-French wines. If I was to try and guess number two, Rossidi Blind, I would put it in, in South Africa, something, something like that, because it's slightly exotic and yet bone dry. But I would I probably, or maybe in Italy, well, but obviously in Bulgaria. Because the sort of ownership of vineyards and the experimentation and so on is, is still relatively new. I mean, we're really only talking about a maximum of 10 years when, when, and for some of these wineries, a lot less than that since they started planting their vines, started to understand their terroir, started to understand, and are still kind of experimenting with winemaking styles. So, yes, there isn't a a Bulgarian style that I could, you know, point out particularly at all in Bulgaria. I think it's still, it's kind of, it's coming, 
but you know it's still too early i think and it's it's right i think that the industry does not pin itself down too much i mean there are you know 47 pdos but hardly anybody uses them they tend all pretty much all the wines here will be labeled as pgis either thracian lowlands or or danube plain um, Danube Plain being the north of the country, north of the, the Stara Planina that could, kind of divides the country east-west, and then the Thracian, uh, the Thracian lowlands to the south of the country. Um, arguably, those PGIs were more political than a reflection of what's actually on the ground, but again, that's another political discussion for another time. But So I think it's right that people aren't tying themselves up too much in knots to try and you know, stick to a tiny bit of PDO restriction when they're still trying to work out what their vineyards can deliver. Actually, there are some pretty stellar prices of uh, wines in the uh, Bulgarian domestic market, um, which sometimes I think is more about making a statement about who can be the most expensive wine in the domestic market than anything else. But those are not wines that we see very often in the UK or even outside Bulgaria's borders. So they're not therefore creating an image for for Bulgaria. Um, and, you know, that's something that, again, Bulgaria still does suffer a bit from when I talk to consumers. They quite often say to me, um, what happened to Bulgaria then? I used to enjoy drinking Bulgarian wines, you know, 20, 25 years ago. You know, they have fond... You know, that generation actually still has very fond memories of Bulgarian wine, but they have an expectation that it was cheap because it was then. So we've got to get over that hurdle and say to people, new Bulgaria is not cheap, um, but there are still some good wines here, but in a different price category maybe. Um, but I think for younger people who don't know that at all, you know, Bulgaria and Eastern Europe is actually, people are saying to me, well, actually, it's quite exotic. I want to go and explore. So there's no, there's not particularly a negative cheap perception either. I think there is a real interest in Central and Eastern Europe. I'm feeling now there's kind of a turning point that people are saying, well, you know, the old world's a bit old hat. We've done the new world, and most of it's copies of the old world anyway, so where can we go and explore? Well, Central and Eastern Europe just has a wealth of authentic history, authentic connection with vineyards and winemaking, um, and has unique grape varieties and wine styles and things to discover. So I think it's a really exciting... For me, it's great that people are actually finally listening to what I've been saying for, for a long time. <laughs> <laughs>